not single rays, but some bundles of rays, some families of light rays that form light beams. Because this is the kind of entity, physical entity, that we need when we are studying, for example, observation in astronomy or cosmology. When you are measuring, for example, distances through, for example, the flux of energy, you need the, uh, an idea of, um, of energy per unit of surface in the light beam. So you, need, you cannot consider just a single ray when you are considering those observables. You need to consider light beams. So this is what we are going to discuss today. And um, so the, the few things that we're going to talk about are so the, the geometry of null geodesic bundles in general in a covariant way. Then I will introduce what we call the Zach's formalism, so the Zach's basis, the screen space, the Jacobi matrix, and the optical scalars that you could see in the literature associated with uh, light propagation in curved space time. All right. So, let's start with, uh, with the beginning, what is a light beam? So a light beam is just a portion of the past light cone of an observer. Right? So if we have a given observer that measures, um, well, that receives photons that are coming from its past light cone, Then a portion of it that could correspond, for example, to the emission of an extended source here. So this is a light beam. Right, so this is just. In what follows, I'm going to assume that all the light beams that are considered, given this definition, are converging towards the observer. You could consider an opposite picture, which is the picture in which you have light rays or light beam emerging from a source and that get extended on your at the observer. And there is a way to go from one picture to another, which is called the Etherington reciprocity relation that we are going to discuss also in this uh, in this lecture. But for the, from, well, to start with, I will start with the idea of well, this convention of light rays converging towards the observer. So now let's go to a, um, uh, to a spatial picture of it. So we have the observer here that receives a few light rays. A bundle of null geodesic. And what we would like to investigate now is the relative behavior of two light rays. Of two. So how do they move with respect to each other? So this will uh, allow us to describe what is going to be the evolution of the shape, the pattern of the, of the light beam with its propagation, which is a thing that we are going to be interested in. All right. So. So this is, um, so let me just do things in order so that I don't forget anything. Yeah, so we want to study the relative behavior of two neighboring light rays. to introduce, um, say, an auxiliary coordinate system that is going to be adapted to the light ray. So I'm not going to describe it in too many details. In particular, I'm going to work as if I were in 2D in the, in the, in the plane of the, uh, of, of the blackboard so that it's easier to visualize. So consider, for example, the set of events on the light ray, on the light beam, so on the past light cone, that correspond to the same affine parameter. So I suppose that 
I, I, I often, often <coughs> manage files all my light rays the same way, with the same kind of initial conditions, yeah. considered the yeah, same affine parameterization. And so say I'm stopping here, this would be long like one, for example. And I'm tracing the curve that corresponds to that for the different, um, different rays. So this is the way to move within the beam, to say so, to go a bit before, to go a bit, a bit further. But I like also another quantity that allows me to, um, to label the rays within the beam. So instead of moving like this, I would like to be able to move like this, so within those cross curves of uh, constant lambda. So a way to do it um, is to define a coordinate, yeah, which is basically a, a label for each rate. This would be rate number one, rate number two, etc. so that you have a continuous description. Physically speaking, or geometrically speaking, then think about it as being, for example, um, the, the um, spherical angles in which you, see, you receive the signal associated with this ray uh, in, when you look on the sky. So if you have a given light ray coming from this direction, you can say, well, this I associate it with, uh, with the direction in which I receive it, and this will be the label for the whole ray. So it's a kind of Lagrangian coordinate for, for the light ray. So for example, this would be P1, 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 So that's um, a way to, uh, to label for this. All right. And from what I have defined here, you notice that this can be used as a coordinate system in the, in the light, in the, within the light beam. And in particular, if it is the coordinate system, then the tangent vectors, the vector fields that are associated with those coordinates are commuting. So let me explain what I mean by that. So the tangent vector associated, well, the, the vector field associated with lambda, it's k. It's k that I define as being d lambda. So the direction in which I am moving when I'm, in, when I'm maintaining all the coordinates constant but lambda, moving in this direction. And I have something here that I can call e theta, which is my definition is d theta. So it's the same if I'm maintaining lambda constant and changing theta, this is the direction in which I'm moving. And the fact that this is a coordinate system, the fact that I can write those vector fields as partial derivatives tells me that they have to commute. So there is this property that um, d theta d lambda equals zero, that I can rewrite like this. So this is this e theta k equals zero. And this means, well, the derivative of this thing min minus the derivative of this thing with respect to k is zero. So this means, yeah, e theta mu t mu k nu minus k nu t nu e theta nu equals zero. Right. So that's differential, a bit of differential geometry. Good property with the with this structure of commutator, it works quite well with the connection so that I can replace those partial derivatives with covariant derivatives. So, see, I can write, so I have this zero. You'll see where I'm coming with that, right? This, so far, you should wonder why is he talking about that, but this will be useful in the next, uh, in the next board. So don't worry too much about it, because I wanted to do this math before. So, e theta mu, lambda mu, and blah blah blah. Can you? Oh, I can even write it like this. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So. So, 
You see, if uh, it's just adding and subtracting the term that is missing, which is gamma, rho, mu, mu, um, e theta, mu, k, rho, something like this. Because the connection is uh, symmetric and I can do that. So we have this thing that we have to keep in mind. So why is this important? Well, it's because I'm going to introduce now a new quantity which I will call the separation vector or connecting vector between two neighboring rays. So now consider two neighboring rays. And now I know what neighboring rays can mean. It's just rays that correspond to a theta and a theta plus delta theta, where delta theta is very small. So theta and theta plus delta theta. So their separation, by definition, is just this thing, which is x mu of lambda theta plus delta theta minus x mu along that theta. So yeah, I'll take See the separation between this event and this event is just by definition this quantity that I call psi mu. And now I can expand this quantity with respect to the delta theta, that is a small quantity. And this gives me, by definition, so d theta x mu delta theta, plus second order quantities. This, um, so by definition, if I write it even better like this, what do you, re so what do you recognize here? I had, if you had to replace this quantity by something we have introduced before, any idea? It's e theta mu by definition. Right. So the way, because we have this e theta, which is by definition the derivative with respect to theta, that means that its component with respect to a given arbitrary x mu is. Uh, dx mu over d theta. This is the, again, this is a bit of differential geometry, but they would all be ascending. So we have this thing, right? We have this equality of um, <coughs> sine mu or d theta mu delta theta. And delta theta here is something which is constant, right? Because it's just the label, the difference of the labels between two rays. For any lambda, this delta theta is always the same. So the properties of these quantities, the properties of the separation between the two rays that gives what is their relative behavior, is dictated by the properties of this vector. In particular, it, in, it inherit, uh, inherits this thing. I could replace the e theta by xi here because they are just proportional uh, and, well, um, and the proportionality uh, coefficient is just a constant. Right, so this is a consequence is that I can also write psi mu Um, another property that this uh, thing has, and this will be the first exercise, you can show that the derivative of psi mu uh, k mu is zero. It's actually a consequence of this of this property. And this means that this quantity is this scalar product between psi mu and k mu is constant uh, along the line B. 
But because at the observer where the, beams where the beam converges, this quantity is zero, right? The separation, because they, they, well, they, they have the common event, so all the light rays have the common event at the observed observation at lambda equal lambda zero. Uh, well, this quantity is zero, therefore, psi nu, a nu is zero everywhere. So you have this uh, thing that the separation is always orthogonal to the line of sight somehow. All right. Now let's go to the more interesting thing, which is really how this quantity psi mu evolves. So basically, trying to answer this question. We want to study the relative behavior of two neighboring rays, so we want to know how this thing evolves with lambda. And this is something that you actually all know, it is called the geodesic deviation equation. Because this quantity, the, the deviation vector, is precisely the one that is involved in the uh, geodesic deviation equation. So let's do that. Alright, let's derive this thing. So it's an, it's an evolution equation. for psi mu with lambda. So let's compute what is the well, covariant derivative of psi mu with respect to lambda. That is to say, k nu, lambda nu, psi mu. Well, here I recognize the right hand side here. So I know that actually this thing is nothing but, um, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, new, number new. Somehow you could consider this a linear differential equation where if this thing is known, it's just a matrix that would be, uh, that would drive the evolution. But it's not enough. Because this thing is actually very complicated to know. I should solve basically to get that the geodesic equation everywhere. So that's not really what we want. We'd like to be a bit, to go a bit further to have a quantity that we can control a bit better. And in particular, not having this uh, covariant derivative of the of the of the form vector, the wave form vector. So let's take the second derivative of this quantity. So again, I mean this, if I want to, to be short, to take my notes. Um, all right, so this is by definition that, that we have here. All right, so we use um, the uh, law for the product of the derivative of the product. So this will be just a rho and rho sine nu and then nu k nu plus uh, sine nu And and I will use again the property of the commutation between k and psi here to put this one here and this one here. So psi rho lambda rho k nu. Just uh, some things to prepare what is going to come.
Now, now so far, I have used just one thing here, which is the relation that I have between Xi and K, so this commutation. But I didn't use the most important information that I have, which is that I'm considering geodesics here. So that I'm considering curves for which K is satisfying a very particular equation. So, furthermore, I know that. So let me take the derivative of this thing with respect to xi. If I do that, like this, I know this is zero because the equation is zero everywhere. And again, I expand. There's only one difference that you can spot, I suppose, which is here I have an Avalaro and I'm not new, and here I have, oops, mm. what did I do? Okay, this is okay. Ah, yes, sir. sorry. Mm. So, yeah, mm. maybe I should be a bit... Do me the next one. Yeah, okay, right. maybe, well, yeah, you're right. I should do it, I should rewrite it like this. So this is also, I just, Changing the names of indices, rho becomes nu, and nu becomes rho. So yeah, you see that the only difference between those two equations is the order of the indices in the covariant derivatives. So in other words, the only difference between those two quantities is a curvature term that I can introduce right now. So I take again this quantity. I say this quantity is that which is zero plus the difference. So second derivative sign with respect to lambda is zero to that plus the difference, which is psi nu k rho. Okay. That is to say, so R, I will have K, K, psi, and let's just write it correctly now. So this is a new. I've got a row. I've got now for this thing in mu here, I have, well, for example, sigma, that is this one, and then mu. Here we go. <coughs> so that is the geodesic deviation equation. Change the name of indices for uh, just a uh, little bit like this. There we go. So the interesting thing with this relation is that if I know and at least approximately what is k for the reference. Um, light ray that I'm considering, and that if I know what is the, the space-time curvature along this ray, then I can tell what is going to be the behavior of any neighboring ray with respect to it. 
through this equation. So that's the covariant approach to the to the, be the behavior of the light beam. But so far we are very, very well far away from observations. This is something which is well, if I ask you to interpret how we, for example, calculate distances from that, or how we calculate the uh, size and the shape of a light beam, you're going to tell me that there is a long way to go. A long way that we're going to walk now. Introducing the Zax formalism. So, the next section of, do you have uh, questions or I know this is very standard, but I want you to do it really like it, because I think it's interesting. Uh, right. So, oh yeah, maybe one remark, which is, this is completely independent from GR. Right? This is just differential geometry. So even if you change the equations of motion of general relativity, if you have an f of r theory of any kind of thing in which you add some, um, some fields, if, in this theory, you still have light rays that are following no geodesics, then this remains true. So let's go to what we call the screen space. And the beginning of the Zax formula. Um, I yes. think you've assumed zero torsion. Like it's true for ah. any of any kind, but I think you assume zero torsion. Yeah. True, probably because of that. If I want to introduce those, uh, yeah. uh, yes, indeed, indeed. <laughs> zero torsion. Well, when we have torsion, we can do anything. <laughs> um, all right, thank you. Um, yes, so we take again our our light beam, our two neighboring light rays, version of the observer, and if we consider another observer, so a second one, not this one, so that's crossing, so whose word line is crossing the light beam at a given lambda, where the beam is not converging, it has a finite size, at least my two rays that I have that are drawn here, they have a finite difference. And I would like to know what is this observer is actually seeing. How, what is the distance between those two, uh, well, rays of light that he receives, he or she receives. So the thing that uh, we are doing in optics, and when we started doing physics, and we had a light source that was emitting light, light rays, and wanted to characterize the properties of those light rays and the beam that they form, we were using screens. Right? We put screens and that were orthogonal to the line of sight, and this is the way we would characterize what is the distance between two light spots, what are the properties of the lens, and things like this. So, this uh, second observer, so I will not, this is actually a spatial picture, so I'm not going to draw a word line like this, just say that. Here, there is a second observer. That wants to characterize the beam. And so, introduces So what are the properties of this screen? So first, right, I suppose that the second observer has a four velocity again as I would call you mu. And a screen because this this is an object that uh, the, uh, the observer is using to do stuff, it is spatial, right? It is a part uh, what well, is a, a, a part of the of the hyperplane that is uh, orthogonal to U mu. So the first thing is that 
the screen is orthogonal to you. It's a spatial thing. The second thing, that, and this is an assumption, is that I suppose that the screen is put orthogonally, orthogonally to the line of sight. Of course, you have a freedom when you, when you receive a light beam. You can put an angle between the line of sight and the, and the screen, but this is not what we're doing here. So the screen is orthogonal to so the spatial direction of propagation of the light, of the light rays, which is what we call d mu in the previous lecture. Transverse. So the screen forms the two planes, the two space, of which I can define a basis. And all the normal, all the normal. This basis, I will call it S1, S2, S like screen. I will use a, cap so a capital Latin index to just give a label to those things. So 1 and 2, I will use A, the S, A, mu, maybe 1, 2. And I will keep this notation for the rest of the... So the capital let, Latin letters A, B, C will be for the screen indices. <coughs> and it has the following properties. So it has to respect those things. So because they are part of the screen, they must be orthogonal both to Q and Z. So we have A, A, mu, mu, mu. Zero, we have S A mu D mu or zero, which by the way implies that we have S A mu K mu equal zero. Because K is just the sum of U and D with the omega factor. And I said it's an orthonormal basis. So we also have that thing. Right. They are orthogonal, so if A equal 1 and B equal 2, their scale product is 0, right. and S is 1. So this is just uh, orthogonal. Right. So this is almost a full characterization of what this basis of the screen is. There is a, la a last thing that I would like to that I would like to specify is how those vectors are changing or not when the screen well when I'm considering another lambda so when I am moving the screen towards another observer etc etc this is the last thing. How are the SAU transported along the beam? And this will be quite reminiscent of the last part of the previous lecture. Remember when we talked about the electric 
uh, polarization, the polarization of the uh, of oscillation of the electric field and potentially the magnetic field, where we, we were in the same situation where we had this kind of projection perpendicular to the line of sight and spatially because the electric field is spatial. So this is a, a bit of a similar thing. We will define, so this will be a definition of what we impose. That our vectors S1, S2 are parallelly transported as much as possible within the light beam so that they still respect those relations. So we would like to have something like this, parallel transport. But actually we cannot do it because if it were parallel transported it would not respect all those things because u mu and d mu are, especially u mu is arbitrary in this thing. So we have to project it. I will introduce this notation. with S mu nu is the screen projector it has the expression that we had introduced before which is the following But now we have an alternative way to write it because we have now a basis for the screen. So an alternative way to write this is this thing. So because the um, well, because the metric which is associated with uh, S1 and S2 is the um, is just a critic of delta, it's just the Euclidean metric. The position of the indices A and B are not very important, so I will uh, violate a bit the rule according to which we sum just when we are uh, when we have quantities which are up and down. So even if yes, they are all down, that means that I'm, I'm summing up. Right. Just a bit of um, interpretation of why we want this kind of thing is because we want to prevent the, the screen or the, this uh, frame that we are creating with the, with the screen vectors to rotate in a spurious way during the propagation. We are going to use those vectors really as a reference, as a way to describe the evolution of the shape of, of the light beam. And we, in particular, we, will not, we, we could want to, um, to characterize how the beam itself is rotating. So we want to prevent as much as possible those vectors from rotating. This is the reason why we are imposing this transport uh, relation. I can give you a small exercise. There is another way to write this thing, consequence, which is better when you're doing numerical simulations, for example, numerical integration of this relation. Um, so exercise two. All that start. In Show that star is equivalent to the following thing. So instead of having a, a, a projection of this, we can write the covariant derivative itself being equal to something else, uh, which is omega minus one hemium d u u d lambda. This kind of transport, which we see here in a clearer way, is also called the Fermi-Walker transport. Sorry, sorry yeah, just yes. to... So this equation basically means that you're going to fix the, the axis of the screen yes. as you yes. move like that. Exactly. Just that. Then yeah, you're yeah. going to compare the, it's really the vector of the line. So this is the thing. Now, so we have this structure with two with two vectors that give us kind of a reference frame, and then we are going to see how the separation, in particular the projection of the separation vector, is going to move with respect to that. So how light 
is going to move with respect to this frame that we have fixed with the Zach spaces. Yes, by the way, with all those things, so orthogonality relations and transport relation, this is called the Zach spaces. You would find, for example, if you look at the, the review by Volker Pavlik, um, this is called Gravitational Lensing from a Space Time Perspective, it's a very good reference. And also, I think, in the, um, in the book Gravitational Lenses by uh, Ellers, uh, Falco, and Schneider, they are defining the Zach's basis in a slightly different way. They say we actually take, um, we don't consider this U thing, and we define the, the Zach spaces as being something which is orthogonal to K, and which is parallelly transported. And then, the vector that is orthogonal to S, that is obtained by this transport, I define it as being U, and this will be my uh, reference, uh, arbitrary uh, reference, a set of reference frames of observers along the beam. It turns out that this is physically not really important as we're going to show in a few in a few minutes. But I prefer this kind of definition because to be clear what we are doing and in particular the Zach space basis itself has a clear physical meaning. It is actually the electric in the, ma the magnetic field. Right, something it's very concrete, it's something we understand what we are talking about. <coughs> Especially in cosmology, it's a bit better to have um, to use this kind of definition. But yeah, uh, I would say that uh, there is a, a, an alternative definition with T S A U over T lambda equals zero and U mu of plane. of light propagation in screen space. Okay. So, now we have all the tools that are needed to uh, really talk about physics. So, previously we had introduced this separation vector between two light rays. And now we are going to consider its projection on the screen. So consider the projection Sign you over the screen space. 
So we write the same new orthogonal, so this would be the screen component, which is this S new new sign new, which is also S New, new, yeah. So, the descaled product, by definition, is why what we would call the A component of Xi over the screen there for Xi spaces. <coughs> So what what this thing represents? If I'm looking at the screen here, and if I consider only two rays within the beam, well, when I'm putting the screen, I get an intersection between the screen and the light beam, or the two light rays, that gives me two light spots that are on the screen. And this Xi A is precisely the relative separation between those two light spots. So this is the physical meaning of this quantity. This is S1. This is S2, for example. And this would this behaves like a Euclidean vector. It's uh, because the index the index here is A it works with the delta A B metric. So this will be all very convenient. What is the criterion? Mm -hmm. It's a very naive question, of course. But what is the criterion of simultaneity? Is it? Ah, that, that's a good question, actually. Are uh, those events, are those two spots uh, simultaneous with respect to the screen or simultaneous with respect to the observer? It's a very naive question. Ah, no, 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 that's a, that's, a, that's a good one. I remember having wondered that uh, already, and what was my conclusion? So the thing is, Xi as a vector is not defined, well, it gives you the separation between two events that are not simultaneous in the sense that they have the same lambda, but not necessarily the same proper time for the observer. The thing is that we are working um, we are working with a very, very small beam. So this is something I didn't mention so far, but you'll see where this is coming. Well, no, I mentioned it actually because I used this uh, delta theta. So the, in the whole thing that I started from here, yeah, we are considering rays that are very, very close to each other. And um, I don't think, no, yeah, okay. Um, I think that there is actually no difference between the. Uh, uh, you know what? Let me think about it again. Is it not simultaneous for the screen? What the screen is there? But there is a difference between. Um, so simultaneously with respect to the screen, it would mean. Uh, that have the same tau for, for the observer uh, that defines the screen. Mm -hmm. So that would be, but the thing is, it's not the same in principle to, to consider the intersection between the beam, or between the two light rays, and the iso tau hypersurface, mm -hmm. and the intersection of the beam with the iso lambda. Not that then we project. So there is a, a bit of a difference, but there are actually a lot of interesting properties of mm -hmm. null bundles that might actually solve this problem and tells you, tell you that physically speaking or the distances and the angles that you measure between those two uh, light rays are actually the same whether they are, but, well, whether they are defined from the iso lambda um, uh, hypersurface or the, the iso tau hypersurface. But I have to make sure of that and, and, and well, I'll tell you that tomorrow. It'll be the introduction of the It was well, the same with the projection would be inside all the time. You would project yeah. inside on the screen and it's the same, it would be always inside, so it's projection. Yeah. Like in general, it would be different. Okay.
But you'll see that there is um, an interesting, well, so I'm going to talk about that in, in one minute, but interestingly, this thing, the psi a, or actually its length, uh, or its angle, is actually independent from the, uh, from the frame in which the screen is put. It's independent from the UU. Which is something which is completely unexpected, but that might be a solution to this simultaneity problem. So, but yeah, let me think about it for the next time. Yeah. All right, um, where were we? So, So yeah, I was going to talk about this actually right now. This uh, and, and then we'll make a small break. But uh, yeah, so you have a very interesting property. Which is that um, so the size and the shape. of a light beam are independent from the frame they are evaluated they are yeah, evaluated in So let me explain a bit better what I mean here. Oh, first, um, I'm talking here about the frame in which they are evaluated where, at a place where the beam has a finite size. So I'm re-talking about this thing of you take one observer, take a screen, see the beam, well, what, take a ruler, well, it has this size and this shape. Then take another observer that is moving at uh, 0.5 the speed of light with respect to this first observer that you consider, do the same thing, take a screen and passing that, measure the, the size of the, and the shape of the light beam, they are going to see exactly the same thing. And this is quite unexpected, in particular, it's not true here. If the observer here is replaced by another one, they are not seeing the same thing. But here, they are seeing the same thing. Yeah. I will discuss the, uh, what happens here a bit later. So, the way to prove that is to consider three rays that are all close to each other. So this would be ray one, ray two, ray three. So you take two as being the reference. The difference between oops, difference between two and three would be psi difference between, also well, psi, uh, psi u, well, the difference between 2 and 1, zeta, and this uh, will be an exercise, I'm going to spend some time explaining what it means, so, um, the exercise four, no, exercise three, sorry, is show that whatever the screen we are talking about, whatever the u mu we are talking about to define the screen, then sign mu zeta mu projecting on the screen is actually equal to sine mu zeta mu. Right, so what does that mean? So for example, the physical distance that there is between this ray 2 and this ray 3, as seen on the beam, 
So what I could call L23, it's by definition psi A psi A, where we that. Right, so this is, in other words, psi mu orthogonal, psi mu orthogonal. The dependence, the uh, frame dependence of this quantity, of this measurable quantity, is encoded in this small sign orthogonal here. Because in this sign orthogonal, I have the um, information that I have defined, the screen that I have defined with respect to a given observer, with respect to a given full velocity. So the whole dependency is here. But because you have this very interesting property, I said theta, but you could replace theta like psi here as well. This is true for any, uh, for any separation vector. Then you can, yeah, because you can forget about this thing, this sign then the dependence, the frame dependence disappears. So this thing is completely covariant. So this observable, even if it has been defined with respect to a given observer and given frame, it is actually something which is completely covariant. And this is very unexpected. Right. And um, for example, the angle between one and three here, uh, I can call it uh, Alpha. Well, I know that. Um, well, the scalar product between those two vectors is just L one two L two three cosine alpha. All right. So this would be sine a zeta a. And I know that this is nothing but sine mu, ah, sine mu, zeta mu. So again, even this quantity, this scalar product, is something which is completely frame independent. And because I, should, I have shown that those things are frame independent because of that, then the angle is as well. Right. So L want to. L23 and alpha are frame independent. Yeah. And you can see that once you have uh, angles and lengths that are the same on well, any kind of shape that you can draw with an infinite number of, uh, of light, light spots, has respects those properties as well. When you say frame, you're saying the frame on the screen. The frame in which we define the screen. So the frame with respect to which the screen is spatial. So you can like rotate the, the frame of 